but his um, his uh, great background, I'm going to leave and let him uh, enlighten us any further that he needs to. And uh, I will say that on questions, um, please think of them carefully because he has so many slides, we don't, we, we don't want to miss them. He will take them if it's urgent to know, but otherwise kind of try and hold them to the end so that we make sure he has a chance to give all of his presentation. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Sapiens. Okay. And uh, we've been in Idaho since about 2006. And, uh, and it was, I think, 2009 that I actually began birding. And as a retired person, we started traveling worldwide. And, and I actually started birding. Um, Seriously, once I came to Idaho. So, um, and with that, I, I too had to take up photography. The photography helped me identify the birds. And so then I, now I kind of think of myself as a bird photographer. Most of the pictures that I've taken uh, are my pictures, with the exception of the kiwis, which are nocturnal. And I have not figured out how to take a, a good picture in the dark. And you weren't allowed to use flash with the kiwis. But those are all, those are not my pictures. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. And uh, Lisa and I um, <clears throat> started, uh, signed up for a birding tour in New Zealand. And uh, this is one of the few pictures that we have of both of us. And uh, as you can see, we both have our binoculars and we were both seriously birding. And this was at Arthur's Pass National Park. New Zealand has a lot of national parks. Okay. Um, the trip was uh, with Road Scholar in late February of 2019. And uh, I didn't show a map of our route, but we basically started in the northern end of North Island and uh, went to Auckland, uh, Murawai Beach, which is a huge gannet colony. And there are thousands of gannets in this colony. And then the Pukorokoro Miranda Shorebird Center, Lake uh, Rot Rotorua, and then the uh, Maori Center. And then uh, we went to Turangi, Boxen, and then Wellington. Wellington is at the southern end of North Island, and it is the capital city of New Zealand. I thought it was Auckland, but it isn't. Uh, then we crossed the, the Cook Strait and went to South Island and started at Picton. We went to uh, Blue Mind Island and then uh, went down the West Coast. No, I'm sorry, the East Coast. The East Coast of South Island uh, to Kaikoura. And uh, that's where we really saw the albatrosses. And then, uh, then the next three areas were um, near the, uh, what I will call the Southern Alps of New Zealand. And then we went to Queenstown, Invercargill, which is the Southern, southern large city in South Island. And then, uh, and then we went to a small town called Bluff. And from there we went to the third island, which is uh, Stewart Island. And then uh, Lisa wanted me to mention that our, on our flight home, we went from Invercargill to Christchurch, Auckland, Los Angeles, then Boise. And it was like a two day trip, just getting home, <laughs> exhausting. And uh, at Stewart, we, we took a catamaran trip across the Fogo Strait and went to Oban. And uh, we did a pelagic birding trip there 
and went to Alba Island, which is a phenomenal island for birding, and took the catamaran trip back. And uh, their currency really uh, has uh, not only New Zealand in English, but also in Maori. And then, as you can see, their, their currency also highlights uh, their endemic birds. Endemic meaning birds that are unique to New Zealand. So the $10 uh, dollar bill has a blue duck and then the yellow-eyed penguin on the five, the uh, stitch bird, and uh, their swamp area. So um, we went to, uh, to Auckland here on North Island, and then the, um, the right about here is where the uh, Gannett colony was. And it was a noisy experience because there were thousands of gannets. And then uh, on a following day, we came over here to uh, Tiritiri, Matanji Island, and uh, it's a reserve. And so again, the birds are protected and it was very, very well. Then, uh, let me see. Then uh, we just went kind of down the middle of, uh, through here by this lake, and then all the way down to Wellington down here at the bottom. And uh, later on South Island, we started at Picton, which is over in this area, and then just kind of followed the west side, or the east side. And then we would take uh, excursions into the Southern Alps. These are the Southern Alps. And, uh, and then we came down here to Stewart Island. And this is Stewart Island. And we stopped at Oban, and then later on, went to a small island called Alva Island. That's probably my favorite trip, was the Alva Island one. It was a walking excursion. And, and this was the catamaran that we went on. It's probably the bounciest ride I've ever had. Luckily, I convinced Lisa to sit in the middle of the boat because the people on the ends got seasick. Then I wanted to show you uh, New Zealand and this is how it looked in terms of forests before the Europeans came and then after the European settlement. They pretty much deforested both islands. And so I'm showing you an example of, of they just clear cut the forest right down to everything and then the next picture you can see where they're reforesting. And so they've eliminated most of the native trees and they're planting pine trees because they're very, very fast growing. And their pine trees um, are um, not native, but they're a fast growing tree. And they don't really have a lumber industry, so to speak, but what they do is they um, harvest the logs and then ship the logs to China and Japan. And then uh, these are examples of Maori land, land ownership uh, before the Europeans and then after. And of course, South Island um, has almost no Maoris or Maori influence. And uh, we did go to a center to see the Maori culture and they're kind of like totem poles in that they have these uh, guardian spirits. And uh, Sky Tower is um, a landmark in Auckland. Of course, we wanted to go up to the top, but they charged you like $30 to go to the top. And I wasn't willing to spend $30 just to take an elevator ride up to the restaurant. So now we're gonna start in on the birds, which is my favorite part. And there's some characteristics about New Zealand birds. The first one is low species diversity, meaning there's only one or two types of birds 
for each uh, species. So like, for example, they have one robin, one blackbird, uh, there's uh, one falcon, one hawk. And so they're very, uh, it's not very diverse in terms of species, not like in Idaho, especially like in ducks. And probably the most diverse part were the ducks. And then a uh, high level of endemism. Uh, endemic birds means birds that are unique to New Zealand. And then uh, a lot of their birds are flightless. And then the giantism, meaning they have very large birds. The land, the land birds, like the moa, are extinct. But the um, seabirds, like the albatrosses, are doing quite well. And then melanism, dealing with um, being very colorful. And then mi mixing taxa means that not all bird families are represented in New Zealand. And they have a uh, high vulnerability due to exploitation and habitat loss. Habitat loss primarily through the lumber industry, just eliminating the, uh, the forest and then planting non-native trees. And exploitation, one of the Biggest problems they had were rat, especially early on, were rats coming off the ships and then uh, eating the birds and eggs. So um, the first series of birds are the kiwis. There were actually five different subspecies of kiwi, but uh, and the kiwi is the national bird of New Zealand. And it's a flightless bird. It's hairy looking and it's nocturnal. And what I thought was unusual was they have a slender bill with the nostrils at the very end of the upper part of the bill. And so they root around in the leaves and grass and they eat fruits, insects and worms. And by the way, the people of New Zealand are referred to as kiwis. And this is the brown kiwi. And those hairy uh, feathers help them feel. And so they're very touch sensitive for finding their food and getting around in the dark. And this is the great spotted kiwi. We actually saw these, but we had to use um, these red lanterns in the dark so we could see them and the little spotted kiwi. And uh, then they had game birds. First one was a uh, ring neck. I'm gonna back this up a second. Uh, on the intro page, I, I put in the scientific name, but I don't in the page with the bird. But here, uh, this is a common Chinese introduction. So I was surprised to see uh, a ring neck pheasant. We have them here in Idaho, but this was actually a picture taken in a park on North Island. And then uh, they also had California quail, which surprised me. And, uh, and they had chuckers. Now, the, I only saw a young chucker, but by looking at the red bill and the red feet, I knew it was a chucker and it was with the quail. But this is what an adult chucker looks like. And this picture is from Idaho, not from New Zealand. And, uh, and then a waterfall. And so uh, they have a lot of black swans and, uh, but they're actually from Australia. They're native to Australia and Canada geese. And I don't think these Canada geese migrated to New Zealand. So I'm convinced that they, they brought them to New Zealand. And uh, the sparrow goose is also a European goose, which they also brought, didn't migrate. But this is the first endemic duck, beautiful duck, paradise shell duck. And the white headed one is the female and the black headed one is the male. They're very beautiful birds and very common. And then <clears throat> the rarest endemic is the blue duck. And so I'm gonna 
point them out here and here. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> so I've got the English name, blue duck, and then Wheel is, in green is the Maori name. So when you see the green, it's the Maori name. Okay, so this is an uncommon endemic. And then they had Mallard ducks, which really surprised me. Again, not a bird that would migrate there. And notice our uh, green-headed Mallard. This is the male with a yellow bill. And this is a female. And again, our female has a uh, orange bill with black spots, kind of a dirty looking bill and orange legs. The reason I'm pointing this out is because they have a very similar duck called the gray duck. And this is the male, which has kind of a yellowish bill, but the female has a bluish gray bill and a very distinct eye line. You can see the eye line on both of them with red eyes. And so they're a gray duck, uh, which is a native there, very similar to our mallard. Why they would bring mallard ducks down there is beyond me. And this is uh, the New Zealand scop cute little bird, duck, and then a green, or gray teal, chestnut teal, and uh, did see Australian shovelers, which are similar to our northern shovelers here in Idaho, but they're from Australia. And then uh, one grebe, which is the dab chick, and uh, the penguins, they have about, um, I'd say 10 different penguins that can be found in New Zealand, but we only saw three, which is the yellow-eyed penguin and, uh, and then the smallest one, which is the blue penguin and uh, it's a very small bird. And then the Fjordland crested penguin, which kind of is flashy, I thought. And now we're going to get into the albatrosses, which are the, to me, the giants. And so, and this is the biggest one, which is the Southern Royal Albatross. And it has this massive pink bill with a creamy tip and a black cutting edge on the upper bill right there. You can see that black line on the bill. And, and that's one of the ways that you can tell. And the other way on, on these is, is the underwing is white, the upper is black. Okay. And then uh, the wandering albatross, which has a pink bill and kind of a yellowish tip. Hard to make out the yellow tip. Uh, and then uh, this one has kind of a, a brown bishop's cap. That means that this, this guy is in breeding colors, okay? So he is ready to mate. And uh, then the, the molly moths are actually um, albatrosses, but they're smaller. And one of the ways you can tell a molly moth is on the leading edge of the wing, you have a dark stripe and then a smaller uh, dark stripe uh, on the trailing edge of the wing. And then the, the Buller's molly mock is very, has a very distinctive bill. I mean, with this bill, hard to miss this guy. And then this, uh, the white cat molly mock, which has a, uh, again, a, a gray bill with a yellow tip and has kind of an angry look. So if you look at their faces, they look angry, even if they're not. But these guys are big, okay? And so this is, a, again, a white-capped molly moth, common native. And again, you can see dark on the top, and they're flying, but leading edge and trailing edge are dark. Whereas on the, um, the other large albatrosses, it's only, there's only dark on the lower, on the the leading edge of the lower wing. 
Okay. And then uh, this is a uh, Salvin's Molly Mock. And then uh, I wanted to come back to this guy. Uh, these birds are called tuber noses and they have these external nostrils on the molly mock and albatrosses, they're on the side of the nostril, right about there. Now back up a second. Okay, you can see it over here on this one, much better. So the nostrils are on the side of the bill. Um, whoops, going wrong way. I'm gonna go to the giant petrel. The giant petrel has one nostril at the very top of the bell, and kind of dark brown. And uh, they were chummy. In other words, they're throwing fish out into the water. And so these birds are fighting over the fish. And uh, the full marine petrels, we only saw one, which is Cape Pigeon. And the Cape Pigeon is actually small, smaller than a gull, and very distinctive because they're kind of uh, of their black and white pattern on the back, on the top. This Cape Pigeon, and there were a lot of them, but they were small birds, but still tuber noses. And then we went into the shearwaters. The shearwaters, my favorite is the sooty shearwater because you can actually see these off the Oregon coast and they migrate all the way to Alaska, but along the western coast of South and North America, and probably one of the most numerous birds. And then the bullish shearwater, fluttering and huts. So, and these are small birds. So they're pigeon size, I would say. So this is a sooty shearwater, but again, you can kind of see the tuber nose right there, or the um, nostril. And the reason they have that is they filter out the salt from their bodies through that nostril. So uh, this is a fluttering shearwater. And uh, I compared the Huttons and the fluttering because the fluttering is brown on top and the, and the Huttons is actually black on top or very dark. So this is the Huttons. And all of these birds, I didn't mention, have a hook bill. So you can see the hook bill and you can see the tuber nose right there. Uh, these are small. And, uh, and then they have the common diving petrel, which is a small stocky bird. And then when they go on land, they burrow into the ground and, and make little burrows like a rabbit burrow to lay their eggs. And then the gannets, they're probably one of my favorite birds. I really like them. When we were in England, saw a lot of them. And this is the Australian, we're gonna look at the Australian gannet. And because we went to the Murray Y gannet colony on North Island, and they breed in colonies numbering in the thousands. And the noise is incredible. Now this is what they look like in flight. And then these are uh, gannets up close. These are two gannets kind of grooming each other, as you can see. And these two might actually be fighting over a nest because their nests are very close. And uh, this is a chick, all white. And then this is a juvenile, which is kind of brownish. And those are, this, this, Juvenile bird is sitting on a nest. So they just kind of make these little depressions in the ground. That's their nest. And I think more, it's more like that to keep the egg from rolling away. Um, now we're going to get into the shags, what we would call a cormorant. And they have uh, uh, several shags. This is where they had the greatest amount of diversity. And this is a black shag, which is an all black, and it has kind of a green eye. And uh, shags are aquatic birds. So they're kind of medium to large, and they all have 
black on the back. And some of them have uh, white on the front. So the pie shag, you can definitely see has white on the front. And, and many of these have uh, yellow skin around the uh, front of the eye, between the eye and the bill. This is a pie shag. And then this is a little black shag. And all of these shags either nest, they're colonial, so they nest uh, either on cliffs or in trees. And the little shag is the smallest one. It's probably uh, 20 inches, and very small. And uh, I thought the prettiest one was the spotted shag. Now this spotted shag, you can kind of see the spots and um, it has, uh, this is a male who is in breeding color. And then uh, the pink feet. So they have webbed feet, but the spotted shag has, it's one of the pink footed shags. And this is the king shag. And it has kind of an orange car on it right there for a protuberance. And you can kind of see the protuberance on these. And right in above the bell. Okay. And it's the biggest shag. And then uh, down on Stewart Island, which is that southernmost big island, uh, we saw the uh, Stewart Island shag. So with herons, they have uh, a reef heron, which made me think of our great blue heron. And then uh, our great egret here is what they call a white heron looked exactly like a great egret to me, but it's their white heron and it's very rare. I was one of the only ones that actually saw it and took a picture of it. Well, it was very common were these white-faced herons. We saw them throughout both islands and they're mostly inland on the rivers. And then uh, the most common hawk, the only hawk we really saw was the swamp area. And I thought I saw a New Zealand falcon. They're a small falcon, kind of like a kestrel. And um, so I'll go on. I thought the, the rails were interesting. And this is a, a flightless bird called a, a weka. Walks around and Pretty good sized bird. I'd say a little bit bigger than a chicken. And then the, the takahe, the takahe is actually uh, quite large. Again, bigger than a chicken and kind of a massive bill. And, and they're very rare. And so we saw them in two different places and all of them were banded. And so, and you can see that massive bill and the red facial shield. And uh, they're about twice as big as the Pukeko, which um, is, uh, the Pukeko I would say is, um, is a uh, Galano, okay, in the Galano family, and uh, sometimes called the purple Galano, okay? And again, a red facial shield. And then they have the Australian coot, which has their white facial shield and white bill. And then you can see this one caught a small minnow. And this other coot is trying to steal it. And uh, what amazed me was, instead of swallowing the darn thing, they chased each other for maybe five minutes before he finally swallowed the little fish that he had. And then they had uh, a lot of wait waiters. So those are the most interesting to me. And so, and they're all abundant. And so the red knot migrates between Alaska and New Zealand. And so, and this is what a red knot looks like in breeding color. And it's kind of funny, they have these cute little white thighs. That's one of the ways you can tell them besides the red breast. But I put this map in 
to show you that the red knot migrates, um, the white shows the migration of the red knot from Alaska and Siberia all the way down, oops, to New Zealand. And then uh, on the way back, it comes around through Australia, China, Siberia, and to Alaska. Okay. So, but the bird that I really wanted to see was the bar-tailed godwit, because this bird is, again, um, migrates from Alaska, uh, bigger than the red knot. And, um, but what's impressive, and, and a lot of them are banded because they're really trying to figure out the, the survival of these godwits. And as you can see, the bill is kind of uh, long and reddish at the base and black at the tip and gray. And then as they get into breeding color, they'll go into red. Okay. And these birds are impressive because they come to Alaska and they feed and they will, they will uh, weigh more than twice their normal body weight. And then once they reach that, that maximum weight of more than twice their body weight, they will fly eight to nine days nonstop all the way to New Zealand, which is over 7,000 miles or over 11,000 kilometers, if you can imagine that. Now, what's impressive is they're not eating they're not drinking, they're flying nonstop. And so by the time they get to New Zealand, their tanks are empty, they're on empty. So by the time they get here, they, um, they are less than their normal body weight. Remember, they were more than twice their body weight when they started, but they're just using all that fat that they accumulated just to get down to New Zealand, and then they'll spend their their uh, their summers down here. They spend the summer breeding in uh, Alaska, and so. And then what's really weird, and I don't know how this happens, is all of the adults leave for New Zealand, and about two weeks later, the fledglings follow them. Now, how those first year birds who have never been to New Zealand know how to get there is beyond me. So that's a great mystery. But then they fly all the way to New Zealand, but on the way back, they, instead of flying straight back, they take a shortcut to China and the Yellow Sea and then, and then go over to uh, Alaska. And one of the concerns that we have is getting the Chinese to protect those feeding grounds because they need to come here and refuel. And by the way, they eat these little worms. And uh, again, uh, another endemic bird, only unique to New Zealand, is this little bird about the size of a sandpiper called the rye bill. And the rye bill is unique I took this out of the book because it has this crooked bill. Oops. It has a crooked bill. And what it does is with this crooked bill, it will flip stones over in the gravel beds of the rivers and find the little worms and critters. And that's what they eat. But um, they're like a small sandpiper with a crooked bill called the rye bill. And uh, they did have semi-palmated sandpipers. And this is a picture of one. I spotted it out there on this mud flat, but it was some distance away. But this is an Idaho. I took a picture, <laughs> a picture of a Idaho semi-palmated sandpiper because I can get much closer to one and you can actually see it with a kind of a black bill and heavy black bill and black legs and feet. Okay, so we have them here and they have them in New Zealand. And then uh, 
This is the South Island Pied Oyster Catcher. Again, this is an endemic, endemic to New Zealand. And they're not migratory like the other birds. They're smart enough to just stick around. And they're a good sized bird. And um, I'd say the size of a gull. And uh, they also have the variable oyster catcher, which is almost all black. And then I found this plover to be quite interesting, very large plover, and it's called the spur wing plover. And the reason it's called the spur wing plover, you can kind of see it on this wing right there. It has a little spur right there, okay? And, and they have these cute little yellow faces and very noisy. And they have stilts like we do. We have a black neck stilt, they have the pied stilt. And, but like our stilts, their legs are uh, all red. And then they have a rare black stilt. Of course, if you're a rare bird like this black stilt, you'll notice they get caught and get banded because they're trying to track them. And then uh, they have uh, the New Zealand dotterel, which is a cute little bird, shore bird. And the banded dotterel, and very similar. And then uh, now we're gonna get into the skuas and gulls. And the skua, we don't have those here, but they do down there. And the skua is kind of like a large brown gull. So this is, uh, the southern skua, and if you'll notice their bills are a little more hooked, but they're very similar to our gulls. And um, this is the, the, gula, the skua in flight. And then uh, they have the black back gull. This is a very large gull, what we would call a three-year gull. And uh, throughout the southern hemisphere, um, this, is, this is the major gull. In New Zealand, they're called black-backed gulls. In South America, they are called kelp gulls. And they're, they're actually bigger than most of our gulls. And then they have a two-year gull. And uh, this is called the red-billed gull. And you'll notice the kind of uh, silver eye and red bill, red legs, red feet and uh, their most common gull. And um, in Australia, they're called silver gulls. Uh, and then uh, they have an endemic bird, which is called the black bill gull, uh, dark legs, dark eye, and dark bill. Whereas the red bill is red. Now, I only saw three turns. They also have Arctic turns, but I didn't see those. And um, this is the Caspian turn. The Caspian turn is the largest turn in the world. We have them here in Idaho. And uh, they have this large orange bill with a black tip. And, um, and then they have the white fronted turn, which is an abundant native turn. And so and you can see the little white front. And this is what they look like in flight, flying towards you. So this is a white fronted turn, most common turn there. Now we're going to get into doves and pigeons. You get not a lot of diversity because the only native bird is the New Zealand pigeon, which is a very colorful bird. Looks like it's wearing an apron. Uh, and then everywhere in the world, you will find a rock pigeon or we, we just call pigeons. And so you find them in the cities. And then they had the Barbary dove. Now looking at this dove, I would have called it a Eurasian collared dove. And, uh, but down there they call them Barbary doves. So I could not tell the difference visually. And then they have parrots and parakeets. 
their parents are kind of unusual. This is the Kia, and uh, which is mostly, uh, I believe the Kia is flightless. And then the Kaka isn't. And uh, the thing I found interesting about the Kaka parrot was that they peel the bark off the trees and eat the bark. So you can kind of, you can see uh, that's what this bird is doing. He's eating the bark. And if you look at this can opener bill over here, you can see that they, uh, it's a very powerful bill. And uh, they're very pretty, especially when they fly because under the wing, they are red. And they seem to be very smart. And then they have a parakeet called the red crowned parakeet. Um, they also have a yellow crowned parakeet, never saw one. But I did see the red crowned parakeet and here he is. And uh, they only have one owl and one kingfisher. And the owl is called a moor, moor pork. This is a moor pork, it's not my picture. We did hear the moor pork because it has this distinctive call that sounds like moor pork. And that's how it got its name based on its call. And then they have this small little kingfisher, cute little kingfisher, small, much smaller than our banded kingfisher. And then they only have one swallow and they call it the welcome swallow. Okay. Now we're gonna get into the native passerines or perching birds, or you might also call them songbirds. And uh, this is called the rifleman, cute. And then the silver eye and um, the gray warbler. I only saw them in one place, even though they're supposedly an abundant endemic. And uh, more common were the saddleback, which has this reddish saddleback, kind of a red butt. And then there's the North Island saddleback. So they're considered two different subspecies, but they're both the same species. And then they have the Tui, and the Tui have this cute little white feathers right here under the chin. And then this one was eating a red berry. And so very colorful birds. And they only go by the Maori name, Tui. Then this is a stitch bird. And uh, it's rare endemic. And then the bell bird. And so uh, some of the places had feeders, and this is where we got to see this bellbird up close. Otherwise, a lot of these birds, they get into the, uh, into the plants and they hard to get pictures of. And uh, we also have another small bird called the whitehead, you can see why, and then the yellowhead. And uh, this bird was the fantail, probably my, one of my favorite perching birds because this bird will take its tail and fan it out into a black and white fan. And so um, very interesting bird and it's abundant on both islands. Now we're gonna get into native passerines. This one here, a little blackish bird is the tomtit. And uh, this is the North Island Robin and the South Island Robin. Personally, I think the two Robins were the same. I couldn't really tell the difference. Now we're gonna get into introduced passerines or perch birds. And uh, sure enough, they have the starling. And so, found starlings just about everywhere, just like in Idaho, but not in the numbers. And then uh, the minas, which are from Asia. And then they have the Australian magpie. 
and they had two versions of it. This one is the black backed magpie, and this one is the white backed magpie. And uh, they're blackbird, only one blackbird with a reddish bill. And if you go to Europe, this is the blackbird you will see in Europe. So as soon as I saw that blackbird, I knew it had come from Europe. And the song thrush is another bird they brought from Europe, Lord knows why. But this is a, a European bird. And then uh, they brought this other little sparrow-like bird, which is not a sparrow, by the way, even though they call it a hedge sparrow, its name is Dunnock. Yeah, but we did see those. And then other introduced passerines would be the house sparrow, which is a finch, not a sparrow, for those of you who are purists. And then the chaffinch, saw those in Europe. Goldfinch, again, these are birds that we've seen in Europe. The greenfinch, the yellowhammer, the cereal bunting, did not get a very good picture of a cereal bunting, but this is what they look like with the striated face. And now we're gonna get into mammals. Um, and what we found surprising is they raised these red deer like cattle. And so they had, in different places, they had herds of these red deer. And, but they're, they're used as meat animals. Kind of like cows. And then uh, we saw the fur seals, which I thought were cute. And uh, these are uh, two nursing seals, seal and nursing. And the females just lay there and, and the little seals just have at it. And then uh, we found this one seal just snoozing in the grass. Couldn't pass him up. And then uh, we saw dolphins. I thought I was pretty lucky getting these two pictures with the dolphin jumping out of the water. And uh, they also had sea lions, okay, much bigger than a seal. And of course, sheep. So the wool, the wool industry is big down there in New Zealand. And they also have a substantial dairy industry, so they have dairy cows. And so especially on South Island, where they primarily deforested most of the, uh, the island, they have a lot of uh, pasture lands. So there are a lot of books. These are uh, three of the books that I would recommend. Birds of New Zealand, The Hand Guide to Birds of New Zealand, and Birds of Hawaii, New Zealand, and Central and West Pacific. But truth be told, the middle one, this one, The Hand Guide to Birds of New Zealand by Robertson and Heather, would be the one that I would highly recommend. Easy to read. But, but then you need to get into the seabirds. And uh, these were some of the books that I referred to on seabirds, okay? So I could learn about the albatrosses and the molly moths. And then uh, this was at the Maori Center. And this is Lisa and I. And, and actually uh, this picture is one of the only pictures where you actually see me with the camera. But we both had our binoculars with us. And that is it. You have now seen almost all of the birds of New Zealand. They do have uh, extinct birds that we saw in the museums, but I didn't include those. So are there any questions? How long was your trip, Dr. Sapiens? Um, I think it was 10 days. And um, I didn't mention this, but we flew into Auckland. We, we went in a day early so we could become acclimated. And, uh, 
and then uh, the travel throughout North Island and South Island was by bus. And there were, the groups are small, there were 12 of us. And by the end, there were only 10 of us. Because on South Island, in the town of Foxton, one lady had a heart attack. Oh, well, it was 21 days. I just got corrected. It was 21 days. I wish we could have stayed for a month. And um, so one lady uh, had a heart attack and uh, Rhodes Scholar was very good about taking her to the hospital and healthcare in New Zealand is free. So she did not pay a dime for her treatment in the hospital. And then Rhodes Scholar We lost you, Alexander. Steve, did we lose sound for Dr. Sapiens? Uh, you've also lost his pictures. He isn't moving. We're not sure uh, quite why we've lost Dr. Sapiens, but there are some uh, different chats.